Thank you all for joining us for a great episode of the Duchenne Live, presented by family, friends, and Duchenne, with your hosts Dr. Ryan Russell and myself, DJ Kimball. We have a great show tonight. We have a wonderful guest joining us again, Dr. Natalie Truba. From Nationwide Children's Hospital, a great friend not only to us but the Duchenne community as well. Dr. Truba is joining us tonight to begin our series on intimacy and Duchenne. Tonight's conversation will focus on the challenges of emotional intimacy for individuals with Duchenne and ways to help us overcome them. We hope that you all are just as excited to begin this conversation on intimacy and Duchenne as we are. Ryan, please take it away. All right, as always, thank you for that, DJ. Glad you're here with us this week. Um, I struggled a little bit last week without DJ. Oh, I won't get emotional, though. Promise myself I wouldn't get emotional. All right, Natalie, we are always glad to have you on here. It's always a pleasure. uh, All right, well, thank you. So, well, okay, in case somebody's new and doesn't know who you are, could you give us a quick intro of yourself? Sure. Yeah, I'm uh, Natalie Truba. I'm a clinical psychologist at Nationwide Children's Hospital. I specialize in working with uh, boys and adolescents and, and men with uh, Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophy. Um, and my job is to kind of uh, address all the all the things that aren't just muscles that go into making you who you are as a human um, to, to try to to improve our quality of life and, and live the life that that we want and have joy and happiness. Well, thank you. All right, first question. Do you have a favorite color? Ooh, Ryan, starting off heavy hitters. That's a tough one. Wait, not what is it, but do you? I I have I don't have a single favorite color. I have I have several colors that I that I very much enjoy, but I love I love colors in general. So I, I would say all colors, but I have a couple that are preferred, so I don't have a single favorite. So just like relationships, there's all different colors, all different types. All right. Definitely. Thank you. I just and hey, I got favorite colors too. So look at that uh something we have in common. All right. So let's get into this. We're talking about relationships. I think we know what a relationship is. Can you explain it to us? What's the purpose of relationships? Like in general, um, and how are they, you know, what purpose do they fulfill in life? Sure. Well, relationships, different types of relationships serves, serve different purposes and different functions, right? We have relationships that kind of fill like a friendship role. We have relationships that are, more sort of intimate partner we have relationships that are acquaintance relationships we have like shared hobby relationships we have family relationships we have mentor relationships we have all kinds of relationships relationships are sort of a a single term to describe a lot of different ways that humans form bonds and and humans do that because we're social creatures right and we have evolved and developed as social beings and we are our best kind of we are our healthiest we're our best selves um even if you are somebody that is an introvert and needs to recharge humans are still kind of their best beings when they're when they have social sort of connection and relationship all right what does that say no man is an island yeah I, no I, I, in 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 by and large right yes so okay talk to me like i don't have dmd which, you know, there's a lot of stuff I don't know. So what are the obstacles that individuals with DMD or probably any disability face with these relationships? We're talking physical, emotional, social cues, communication. Yeah, that's a that's a loaded question. I think I think relationships, depending on the type of relationship you want, I think the barriers are different, right? Um so if we're talking, you know, intimate partner relationships like dating, the the there's a lot of barriers and, and things that are hard for anybody dating, right? Like regardless if you have a disability or not, like dating is stressful, dating is scary, dating is overwhelming, dating doesn't always pan out the way you want it to, regardless of, of what you do. 
and that's true if you have a disability or don't have a disability, right? Um, things that are unique when you have a disability are, you know, the function of sort of the impact of mobility challenges, stigma, um, helping people understand, getting to kind of present and be yourself, navigating the, the real elephants, right? Like we've talked about before, like having paid caregivers maybe with you that are helping and like incorporating that into a social situation that is, would maybe a typical for another person, right? So like, how do you normalize and bring in what's normal for you and whatever that, whatever you need to manage your life, having a disability into trying to form a connection with somebody that maybe doesn't get that yet or doesn't know that, right? And so how do you do that in a way that's comfortable for you and comfortable for another person? And that's going to look different for everybody and def definitely different depending on disability, right? Right. Um, so we have some examples that I guess have come up for the community. Uh, uh, you know, there's always, I think DJ and I both know that um, like, you know, it's common, like nobody can see past our disability, maybe not feeling like an equal, can't live up to expectations, doubt. So my first question is, is this normal? Absolutely. That's absolutely normal. I would, I think the hard part is when, when we're trying to talk about relationships is that it's, those are fear. Those are fears that you would have if you didn't have a disability, right? And then you add a disability on top of that, and it makes it that much louder, right? And that much, it's that much harder to kind of overcome or kind of, you know, have that voice in your head be helpful to yourself or healthy, right? Because you get all these other messages, and you've had a lot of experiences, and it is, it can be a lot harder when you have DMD, right? Because it's harder sometimes to make those connections because of how our brains are, right? And we might be a little bit inattentive, we might be a little bit impulsive, we might get a little fixed on things. And that can be hard sometimes for other people to, to kind of uh, adopt or accommodate. And it's hard for you all sometimes to accommodate and be flexible, right? And, and part of a relationship or doing something with another person is a lot of flexibility and give and take. And that can be, that can be really hard, right? Like that's kind of a brain barrier, you know, um, as to your first question. But so, I mean, it's very common to feel you know, what am I bringing to the table? Who would like me? What do I have to offer? Um, and, of, and I think, of course, that will be a louder voice in your head if you have a disability, because our society has spent a lot of years and a lot of time sending messages like that about having a disability, right? Which isn't true. We all know that. Um, but the larger society is still learning, right? And they're still adjusting and knowing, kind of like, you know, destigmatizing themselves. Right. Um, and, you know, that stigma, it's kind of, once you get to a certain age, it maybe takes a little bit longer with DMD, but, you know, maybe I could, like, it's taken me a while. I can see now that people can look past the disability, but even now I've had some, there's somebody, I said something about my PhD or something, and they started laughing. They thought I was joking. Till somebody next to him, uh, he's not joking, he's, he's serious. Oh, but, you know, so there is that. They don't expect you to, but, um, you know, so what would you recommend that somebody oh. does to kind of try to get over that? Well, I think it, that's a loaded question. These are these are great questions. They're very loaded. Um, maybe we could take a more piecemeal, because that might be a little bit easier to kind of tease apart. So. That's a good question. I think there's always value in room to sit and think, what are the messages that I've internalized? What are the things that I tell myself or the messages I tell myself or the beliefs I have for myself that might be barriers, that might be not somebody else's issues, right? They might not right. be the issues that they're bringing, but the issues I'm bringing. So, you know, and this is true if you have a disability or not, okay? Um, but I see it a lot with a lot of the men that I work with and when we do therapy, but um, that the the concept of like, well, who would want me because I'm not a primary breadwinner or I can't be a protector or I, uh, I need somebody to help me with stuff, right? These are the three things that men usually say as the reason why people, women will not want to date them. And when you talk to women though, these are not, these are not 
the things that they're looking for. They're no, women aren't saying I need, I want somebody to fully take care of me. I mean, there are women like that, right? Just like there are men who want to be taken care of. Women can have jobs, they have their own financial security, right? Like they can do their own thing now. This isn't the 1940s. Um, you know, most women want a partner that they can, or, or men, right? If you're, if you're um, depending on your sexual orientation, but most people want a partner, right? They want a partner that they can grow with and do life with. And, and share things with. And that means like, you know, it's a yin and yang of balance. And so you, you want someone that balances you, right? And so somebody that you can grow with and, and, and do life with is much more important than, than a lot of the things that we tell ourselves that we want in relationships. And so sometimes if, if you're finding yourself in a place where you're like, what do I bring to the table? No one's going to want to date me. Like what value do I have? I would challenge to be like, what are the messages that you have for yourself about what is desirable in dating? And what are you, what are you focusing on in your own and who you're looking for to date? And what are the messages you're sending out? And what are the messages you're receiving that you're prioritizing? Cause it, it might be that, that, that you're maybe part of the problem there. Right. And that like you are doing things that aren't kind to yourself or helpful, but your expectations for yourself and for other people are just really not, on base they're just not they're fantastical or they're or they're unfair or they're not grounded in a like in something that will truly make you happy right because they're not attached to your values and what's important and like what do you want in life and that's hard yeah. when you're young right in your teens and at 20s that's why people date which is hard when you have any disability especially hard you have dmd right to kind of date and like feel that out and so then those experiences when they're limited you kind of put more value on them right because you feel like I might have less and so I really need to like this needs to be really important and I need to like really I need to be really on it because like if she doesn't like me or he doesn't like me or whoever like what if nobody ever does right and I imagine like being on the receiving end of that like that could be really intense for somebody right and then so so all of these little things like you know the you could be trying to do something that you think is helpful to yourself and it might not land that way to another person. And so that, you know, there's a lot of nuance with, with relationship building because like, it's, it's not just about you, right. It, there's another party involved here that, that have their own, their own things that they want, that they like, that they need. Right. And, you know, I, so we do cause a lot of our own problems when we project, I would think others are going to feel. So, you know, some of the other things that, I think we come across a lot with, in this community or those who maybe feel awkwardly shy. Um, it can be hard to trust somebody. One thing is like being obsessive over superficial things or if you know everything's not perfect. I think one of the challenges we have is the things that we've had to accept in our life is normal. Is it normal to most people? You know, we have to we share things with a lot of people that that's totally, that's normal life to us, but it's not to other people. But, um, you know, what's something, um, I'm sure we'll talk about it a little bit more, but, you know, being shy or um, worrying about superficial things, you know, what's like one step we could do to try to help elite with those issues if we have that issue? There's a lot of things I think that people can do to help with like feeling more comfortable in social situations or helping feeling shy or helping feeling less anxious with that. When it, when you boil it all down though, like if I, regardless, is it friendship? Is it raise your hand in class? Is it is starting a really starting a conversation with somebody who you find attractive or just trying to like meet somebody? What boils down to is, is the doing, right? And when we're nervous or when we're anxious, what we you know, the ways that you tend to respond, there's only so many ways you can respond, right? And what a lot of people will do is like, they avoid it because they're like, oh, that makes me uncomfortable. So I'm not going to do it. And really the only way to get comfortable with that is by doing it and by practicing and by kind of forcing yourself to develop a level of comfort or a level of comfort feeling uncomfortable, right? Because there's, that's the process. Like that's the only way to meet people and to do that is by doing it. Right. And, and unfortunately, right. that means then there's a certain level of risk and willingness to be uncomfortable and willingness to allow yourself to feel that way, because a there's there's a potential benefit that you want. And also belief that if I do this more and more and the more I do this, the less scared and nervous and anxious it will feel. But the only way I'm going to get there is by doing. 
And that's, that's kind of when you boil it down at the end of the day, like that, regardless of what kind of relationship, like that's the process. And, and that can be hard. I'm not trying to, I'm not saying that flippantly, like, oh, it's really easy. You just have to make yourself do it, right? Because if it's easy, I'm going to be doing it. Um, that's where therapy and other things can come in helpful to be like, how do I make myself do these things that really scare me, right? But, but, but that's where you would seek that out because at the end of the day, that really is what, you know, what you need in order to, to do that is that you have to do it. Right. Yeah, just real quick before I turn it over to DJ for a little bit. Um, are, do our social relationships have a, an effect on our mental and physical health? Absolutely. Absolutely. Loneliness, um, loneliness and isolation kills. Like it, it has a real impact on your physical health, has a real impact on your mental health. Your mental and your physical health have a direct impact on each other. Humans are not designed to be in complete isolation and in in by themselves and in complete solitude there are people that seek that out and want that but by and large right as as a as a biological species like that is not something that is good for us and so when you want that and you don't have that right it can it can cause a lot of a lot of negative and ill effects for your mental health anxiety depression um you know adjustment type of issues, increased substance use, all sorts of things that people do to cope and physically can, you know, stress can cause a lot of damage on your body. But um, yeah, there's real physical health effects and, and mental health effects from, from not feeling supported and having social relationships in isolation or being isolated. And um, the tricky part here is, is perception too, right? Because you can, you can, you can perceive yourself to be isolated and not supported and socially alone, even if you are around people, right? That doesn't mean it feels the way you want it to feel. You can feel alone, even if you're surrounded by people, right? So it's not just that right. you have people in your life, your parents or whoever it is you live with or people that help you take care of you. That doesn't mean you're, you have your needs met. Does that make sense, Brian? Right, it, it does. You know, I've experienced that surrounded by people yet i feel you know, felt alone yeah and that's like a special type of hell alone right like yeah. when you're alone, alone you're kind of like oh okay i'm like alone like i get why i feel this way right but when you're surrounded by people and people that you love and care about right and still feel alone in, in a way like that is a really really challenging place to be yeah and i'll just say from personal experience it's a lot better to be around people than by yourself so appreciate it while you got it and um, that, I'll turn you over to DJ for a little bit. If we could, Natalie, I would like to use the segment to discuss emotional intimacy. Yeah, let's do it, DJ. Natalie, to begin, could you please share with us the comorbidities associated with Duchenne and how these differ from or occur more often than those who don't have Duchenne. Yeah, so the comorbidities in Duchenne, um, by and large, tend to be things like ADHD, anxiety, depression, expressive language concerns, social and emotional sort of pragmat pragmatic difficulties. Um, some hyper arousal, some OCD like experiences, um, anger or like quick to anger, kind of like kind of intense emotions developing kind of quickly. Um, the prevalence rates are so much higher in, in Duchenne and Becker than you would see in the, in the general population. And that's for full blown. Like you meet every single diagnostic criteria and someone could say like, oh, you meet every one of these. We can check off that you have this disorder. But if we move away from disorders and we look at what are the things that impact life, though, even if just like one thing, so it's a statistic of um, guys and boys with DM, DBMD have some sort of, of um, behavioral and emotional effect that causes them, impacts them on a daily basis, which is super high. That's way higher than you'd expect in the general population. So it's actually in our community, much more rare to have no issues that nothing affects you than it is to be affected. So I'm always looking for the unicorns, right? Like when I meet somebody with 
Duchenne or Becker, like, I'm not like, do you have anything that goes on that causes you problems? I'm like, do you not have anything? Because I anticipate and expect because that's the impact on the brain and the body. Like, it's a lot. It's real. It's it's much more rare to not be affected than to be affected behaviorally and emotionally in some way. Not that everybody has a disorder. That's not what I mean. But every but by and large, a lot of a lot of y'all have real things that make make certain things harder than it would for somebody making all the dystrophin that their body is, you know, um, can make or should be making. As a follow up, Natalie, could you also share how these comorbidities can affect the social skills for many of us with Duchenne? Uh, I don't know if we have enough time for that one, Deej, uh, but I'll try my best um, in all sorts of ways. Right. So, you know, I'm, I, you, you, you guys, you know, Deej and Ryan have heard me, you know, talk their ears off about this a bazillion times. So I sorry for being a broken record, my friends. But um, as a human, you know, there's only so many ways you can manifest really complicated internal processes. And what we know about Duchenne and Becker is there's a lot of really complicated internal processes that we're just learning about. Right. And so when we see that play out, we are like, you know, that's, that's this, or that's this, or that's this. Um, and at, at, at the end of the day, it's really, uh, it really comes down to you as an individual, how does that play out for you? And how can we then anticipate maybe what that would look like socially? So if you're an individual that is an attentive, right? And it's hard for you to stay focused. It might be really punishing for somebody to have a conversation with you because it might seem like you're not paying attention, you're not invested, or you're not listening to them. Or if you're somebody that gets really rigid or fixed on something and it's hard for you to shift to something else, it might not be very enjoyable for somebody to do something with you or, or want to spend that kind of time because then you're kind of like only want to do it one way or you only can think about it how you're thinking about it. Or you only want to do it how you want to do it. And like, that's not relationships, man. That's like, like master slave relationships are like give and take like you're you're kind of compromising but it's like a willingness because you want this person to enjoy these things with you and you want them to want to do these things and that means then kind of allowing or being softer on your edges so that people can accommodate themselves into the things you want to do right and that could be hard if you're really rigid if if you are struggle with a lot of lot noises and crowds, like imagine trying to go out and meet people, that would be really overwhelming and that would be hard, right? And then if you're overwhelmed and you're in this setting and it's loud, then all the things that you might do, right? Because you're dysregulated kind of play out. And then that might make people be like, oh, I don't know if I want to, that's a lot. I don't, I, I don't think they're okay, right? Because they don't understand like what happens when you get really overwhelmed, right? If you're somebody that, kind of gets easily frustrated or you're particular and you're trying to build a relationship and somebody just doesn't do something now you would expect them or what you would think somebody should do and then now you're like upset with them or you're like why would they do that or you like feel a type of way and that's something I see a lot in in y'all is that you're there's like this these feelings about what people should be doing or not doing or what the rules are and they didn't do it like that and then that bothers you and again that comes down to being a little rigid and fixed um, but that makes people feel a type of way. And, and unfortunately, when you're an adult and you're not in school anymore, people like there's, there's relationships aren't by proximity, just like, who are you by? And these are the type, these are the people I can make friends with. Now you have the whole world and people just, when you hit an adult, they're just kind of like, I don't need to put up with this. And they don't. And if you're somebody that needs somebody to have a lot of window of tolerance for you, because like you want to be a certain way and you can't be flexible, then adults are going to screen that out because they're like, I don't got time for that. I need somebody like that. I want, I also want to feel like my needs are being met, right? Because it's not just about you and they have needs too. And their needs might not be like, I want to like sacrifice all of who I am to accommodate this other person. Natalie. Could you please speak a little about the key skills that are needed in building relationships and which of the comorbidities associated with Duchenne present the biggest barriers in building those relationships? Well, I can certainly share my opinions on that, DJ. Um, 
probably I would I would caveat this right just real quick that the biggest barriers are probably going to be pretty unique or ideographic to each of you as an individual depending on like what it is that you struggle with or where you find it easier to to be uncomfortable right um uh so that's my caveat preluding to what I'm about to say um so I I feel so let me think I want to start this stage that's a good that's a good question um I think the skills that are most important are the same if you have Duchenne or not. I would say the skills that are important for relationship are flexibility, a willingness to learn and be open to experience and to, to growth, to receiving feedback, to allowing yourself opportunity to, to be uncomfortable, developing comfort being uncomfortable, and a willingness to be vulnerable. Um, with Duchenne, I don't think any of those things are not possible. I, it looks different, right? Because the vulnerabilities are different and and the things like anxiety and um, rigidity. So those are probably anxiety, right? Because you guys know how I feel about labels. So anxiety, we're going to say that. Anxiety and rigidity, cognitive rigidity and inability to be flexible in how we think or how we see the world or how what rules are, what rules we apply to ourselves and how we apply them to other people, our expectations, I think are the biggest things that get in y'all's way. If I had to like put like a broad, brush it with a broad stroke, so to say, but as I, I will say this again, you meet one person with DMD and you've met one person with DMD. Okay. So everybody has a totally different need here. But if I had to, if I had to paint a broad stroke, cause you're asking me to, I would say in, in, in rigidity and thinking and behavior and anxiety and and why that is is because when you guys when we're really anxious and we feel stuck and we're not willing to expose ourselves allow ourselves to feel uncomfortable put ourselves in new situations allow ourselves to feel that anxiety then we're very limited okay so i think that that's a big barrier to allowing ourselves to be less limited in our experiences and the rigidity and inflexibility i think is their biggest barrier in actually developing or or having relationships with people that feel good to them as well. Um, because when you're really rigid and inflexible, other people are doing all the accommodating and sacrificing to kind of keep you happy and wanting to like kind of meet you where you're at. But that doesn't always feel fulfilling for them. And so I think that that contributes to maybe less robust relationships than, than people want. Or, or or hoping for sometimes in in things, I think the the this the B part of the anxiety piece is that I think um, because we get uncomfortable, I think sometimes we do things that are easy, which is any human. That's not just having Duchenne. That's anybody. We call it response effort, and humans are always going to take the path of least response effort. That's just how we are. And what we know about humans is the more response ever, which means we have to put a little bit of effort in, right, to do well, is where we we kind of learn our best, we do our best, or perform our best, okay? Not when we're doing the least, not when we're going so much out of our, our zone of ability. So low response effort things are like, I only socialize with people online. So what the people I play the video games with, they're only the video games that I like, and I socialize with people in the context of only doing things that I like and doing the things, the video games I like and the ways I like to do them. That would be the lowest response effort, right? Well, it's going to be really hard to meet people, right? If that's the only way that you're allowing yourself to socialize with people, right? That's a really limited world then, because now you're you're limiting yourself to one particular game and only people that like that game and want to play it in the way you want to play it, right? Which I don't know if there's a ton of women doing that. I'm going to guess no, but maybe there are some, right? But then that makes that dating pool a little bit limited. Um, so I think that anxiety piece really gets in our way of allowing ourselves to be in novel situations where we would be exposed to developing the skill sets we need to develop more meaningful relationships, right? Like talking to people in person and navigating and using different skills like humor and thinking on your feet and, and, you know, flexibility to form more rich relationships and get to know people over a shared experience or a hobby or something that you have in common in real life that helps connection. So humans do connect better. I mean, you can have very meaningful relationships online. Don't get me wrong. 
but there is a different type of connection that happens when you're with people in, a, in the same proximity. And so I think, you know, in a long-winded response to answer your question, DJ, sorry, um, that anxiety and rigidity, I think, probably are the two things that get in your guys' way the most. maybe not even anxiety. I don't, I don't think that's the right term. Um, I think it's, it's in, a, it's in unwillingness to be uncomfortable or vulnerable and feel uncomfortable to allow ourselves to gain an experience. I think that that's a better way to say it than anxiety. And Ryan, I think maybe you were trying to talk, but you were. Uh, like yeah, I, I hope I'm not interrupting. I think I, it's my turn now. Uh, but I was just going to say, I actually know several women that play video games. Oh, sure. Yeah. Women play video games. Yeah, and a lot of them, this is for the guys out there, they weren't really interested in video games till their boyfriend or husband or whatever got them into it. So there you go. And this is just my advice. And also, if you do find a girl gamer, treat her like a normal person. Some go very, uh, act very ridiculous. For Agree. Yeah. Game, so. it's definitely female gamers. And I'm not saying they're not female gamers. Um yeah. but I I think that female gamers are also gaming often because they like it and it's fun. They're not always just trying to like develop into yeah. a date. Like, and so I think sometimes I talk to a lot of guys who feel relationships mean something a lot different than it does to the the female gamer they're playing with, and then they get hurt because they're either reading into things or not recognizing that like women also want friendship. Right. And, and developing women friends might be a really good way to practice having females and other or men or whoever you're into, but having those relationships that aren't just aimed at like a sexual outcome, but in a way that's just like, there's real benefit to learning things from other people, including people of the opposite gender or gender identity. Right. So I just had to put that PSA out there. Thank you. So we're going to talk more about real life, which I know you've already talked about that. Uh, we're talking about how this affects us in childhood, adolescence, adulthood. And um, I'm, like, I know from listening to you that, you know, we do have different stages that we go through. Um, so let's talk about how you know, the intimacy of relationships. How does this work out, like play out in childhood with DMD? Yeah, I think it definitely looks different, right? Because children don't have the same motivations for relationships as adults. Like children want friends and buddies and um, it's much more over shared activities like playing and, and, and the things that we know are really important for kids' development. But the stakes are a lot less high tends to be very focused on proximity. Who are you closest to? Who's in your class? Who do you go to school with? And then who do you then in that limited pool share some interest with, right? right. And, and so it looks different because it's usually friends and it's usually focused on, you know, fun. It, it, a lot of time in childhood, usually in childhood, DMD is still walking. Yeah, exactly. So it's, so the barriers are also different because you're, it's a lot easier to engage in activities with that everyone's doing without needing to accommodate or modify or, you know, kind of stop or be like, I can't do that. Right. And so it's a lot easier to, there's a lot more inclusivity and, and there's a lot less sort of um, the lack of better words. Cause I, I'm, I can't think right now, but there's a lot less like messed upness around like the support for disabilities, right? Because like, once you start using a chair and stuff, the world, you know, stops being designed as easily for you. Like people are like, oh, we're going to do this thing. And you're like, okay, cool. Like, give me like 20 minutes. I can like, blow my chair up. And they're like, oh, we left like 15 minutes ago. Yeah. Like there's not like, they just, there's not the thought to that. But when you don't have those barriers, like when you're still ambulating and a child and have good mobility, like it, that, that kids don't have to accommodate around that, right? They could just keep going at the speed they're going at and you just go with them. Right. Um, I have, before I ask the next question, I don't, as a childhood, I had a friend that was a friend before I went to the wheelchair and a friend after. You know, before I could go to their house and do stuff. I remember I walked home from school with them one day 
then the next year I was in, used a wheelchair, couldn't really do it as much. And at first, his mom could just pick me up and put me in a car. But then at some point, she got where she couldn't do that anymore. So, yeah, there is definitely a change. But um, staying, staying on childhood, what are the social cues or skills that kids with DMD frequently don't learn? I don't know if I can answer that because I haven't, I actually haven't counted something where I'm like, oh man, nobody's learning this. Um, it really is a spread. It kind of depends on family and like where people are comfortable and like the bandwidth, you know, like I'm a, I'm a parenting a psychologist. It's like really where I focus the majority of my work. I do a lot of parenting work and, and there isn't like a one size fits all. Like, and I, parents are parenting to their child and, and what we know about even non DMD fans that we just know about parents and child diets is that parents and parents modify their parenting behavior based on their child sort of behavioral baseline and so parents parent their kids different they don't parent their kids the same they actually parent them kind of different I imagine that's I think that's the same in DMD and and I think there are a lot of really obvious co-occurring and comorbidities in within the population but I think parents you know parent parent to the kid. And I think where we go wrong in DMD is when we don't know how to do that because our kids are very rigid or they're very overwhelmed or they're easy that then we don't know what to do. And so then we do all these things to, to minimize things, the experiences where they really need to learn those skills. Right. And some of you might be like, wait a second, but in all your other talks, you talk about trigger management and staying ahead of stuff and not letting these things happen. Truth. I do. Right. And this might seem counterintuitive, but it's not. This is why I also talk about habit development around the times where you can't do that. And like, then it's like, how do you teach how to do this so that they can be in these environments? Because that is part of life. We can't not, the expectation can't be like, you never experience things that cause distress, then you're not learning anything. And so it's important that we mitigate and we try to stay ahead of the things we know that we can predict, because that's where we can learn and teach how to actually do this, right? That's the goal of, of staying ahead of things. And so I think where, you know, again, if I had to paint it with a broad stroke, I'd say it's 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 the time and effort that goes into helping a child who can stay fixated on something for five, six, seven hours, days. How do you sit with that as a parent when you have competing things? Like I have other kids, I have to make dinner, I have to go to work, I have to do this. And so sometimes it's like, you know what, I can't do this with you right now. And maybe, you know, and that might continue. And, and then we're just not developing the skill because like we don't have the time because it takes so much effort to help develop that skill. So I'm not, I, I don't say that to be like a Debbie Downer, but just to speak to that, it's, it's hard. I don't think it's like a parenting deficit. I think that these are hard things to teach and that that's where therapy and other things comes in to kind of be like, how do I do this? Because I don't know how to easily parent to my kid because my kid is doing, does things that I don't, don't, my other kids didn't do. And I was not ever taught how to do when I was watching people parent. And I get all this advice, none of which helps because they don't, their parent, they're telling me advice that doesn't apply to kids with DMD. And so it really comes to like the fit and like having somebody like me or somebody else, you know, that can help you like get to know your kid and get to know like, how do we help them develop the skill based on who they are, right? Because remember, everybody's an individual, even if you, regardless if you have DMD or not, you have unique ways that you think and you feel and that you see the world and helping teach the skills in the context of that is really important because I can tell you all day, like what works for me, but that's not necessarily going to work for you. And so having something that can help you modify and accommodate that to be like, okay, my kid needs to learn how to talk to people. Well, what gets in the way of that? What makes them uncomfortable? What are the steps they need to start to feel comfortable? And then how do we build a plan that we can get to a place that the expectation isn't that we don't do this thing, but that we do all these things so that we can do this thing and get it through it and have it be successful, right? Because if we don't, they're never, they're not going to learn the skill, right? So I think a low hanging fruit here is medical visits. Like how do you incorporate your child into medical visits? right? Are you the only one talking? They look to you and then you're answering because they are looking to you and you're like, we got to get through this. Let's go. Well, that happens. You'll go to the doctor, what, once or two times a year, maybe to your neuromuscular visits. And now all of a sudden it's been 10 years and nobody talks to, to the, to the, to the kid or to the young man. They're just looking at the parent and the kid's looking at the parent and here we go. And now we're just really have never developed the skill set of talking with medical professionals or strangers that are parents there. Right. And then if that's playing out in the medical visit, that's playing out all sorts of places. Right. And so it's, it's little, it's little things that build up over time. And I, and if really, you know, um, 
yeah, I'm going to stop there since now I'm getting into like some of the weeds there, but. Yeah. Um, yeah, it does. It, it does need to be a individual base, and, but that is true. You know, for most of us, you know, you go to the doctors, your parents go with you. Uh, you turn 18, you still live with your parents. And yeah, very easily, you can be 30 years old, your parents are still answer where most, you know, a lot of people have left home. So, so that is good to be aware of, you know, who are, who's answering questions, and who's being asked. And um, yeah, so just like with the comor comorbidities, yeah, ADHD and OCD, I think you kind of answer those, but that does, yeah, it just as it depends on the situation. So we move from childhood to adolescence, and still in adolescence, it depends on just where you're at. Some people can still walk through to 20, you know, into the early 20s, and some still go to a wheelchair at 10. But um, but for all of us, whether you're still walking or not. By that age, it's obvious for other kids to tell that there is something different about you. So, you know, how does it, can you say, like, what are some things that we experience in adolescence with DMD &D and with relationships that maybe people should be aware of? What do you mean? Uh, I'm not exactly sure. I didn't write the outline. The outline, but I'm just meaning. So, you know, how does this affect us in adolescence versus childhood? What are some extra challenges? You know, a lot of times, teenagers go through that phase where they kind of, you know, they go in the room, shut the door, they want to eat in the room, they want to be by themselves. But then, when you've got a disability. So you got to have people there with you all the time. So maybe what are some challenges that that causes in adolescence? Okay, gotcha. Um, well, I think the, the first biggest challenge with that is unique to Duchenne and Becker and other, you know, progressive weakness disorders is that in adolescence is a very unique time of life where you're, you're, hormones are a hell of a drug and your brain is rescaffolding and you're you know you're you're doing a bunch of things or getting your body and your mind ready for adulthood and one of those things is is you start to you know separate and see yourself as a as a as a, a unique individual separate from your family separate from your parents and you have your own values and you have your own your own ways of seeing the world and it's a time of life where it's expected and it's healthy and in, 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 in a healthy way, like it sometimes isn't healthy, but it's expected that peer relationships start to take a more central, important role, right? And so adolescence is a time where where parents' word used to be gospel. And, and if parents said it, it must be true because they're my parents. It starts to shift. And now what my peers say and what my friends say is, is what I believe and is weighted more. And that can be really hard on parents, right? But that's something that is a really important part of development because it, it's 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 a place you're still safe because you still have this parent support, but you're kind of flexing and learning to be independent and to be your own person, to have your own thoughts and to see yourself as a part of this family unit, but as a separate entity, like alongside that family unit and to have these own in, outside influences. And it's a really important time of life. And, and when you don't get that as easily or or at all or um, that's harder to do that impacts that, that development piece of independence and seeing yourself as a separate entity and individual and having, you know, a unique, you know, sense of self, you know, separate from others. And that can then make it really hard to feel motivated or even to desire or to feel safe or comfortable in relationships that aren't just your family. Right. And it can make that anxiety piece that much harder. And, um, and, um, so I think that's a, I think that's a very important piece to talk about, Ryan, because I think it's something we miss in the community because adolescence is already really hard. We're very focused on our younger guys and now we're very focused on our men, um, and, and really trying to figure out like, what are we doing to improve 
lives here. And then our adolescents are just kind of going through this like tumultuous hormone hell kind of, right? And then they don't necessarily have the same outlets or it's not as easy. And then kids and adolescents in particular are kind of assholes. And it's hard time of life for anybody. Like I remember like my least favorite time of life was middle school. And I know a lot of people that feel that way. I joke, like if I die and go to hell, I'm going to come back and be a middle school teacher and be like, oh my gosh, I messed up so bad. Um, Because that's how like horrible I found middle school. And so I think, I think it's just a hard time of life for anybody. And then when you add a physical disability where it looks and and your ability to be normal and just like everyone else, and you just want to be like your peers, like that makes it really loud that you're not right. And then because of all the crap that is society and the messages people get, it becomes a time where it's like, you want to be different from your family, but not different from all your peers. And you are right. And that makes it really hard to, to do those things that, that everybody else is doing that help move that development piece along. And there are guys who are really good at that still, right? Those really ex- extroverted, gregarious guys with DMD, right? They're kind of rare, but, and they can do that, right? But it, it takes a lot and you have, a, if they have a good friend group and they can kind of get navigated into that, but they still have the same challenges in ways like driving and your friend and like dating and, you know, how do I, I want to go to college, but like my mom's in my care. Like, so the, the needs look different. They still have their very unique pieces to that right but uh, right. but there has to be a lot of other things in place for that to be as easy or as streamlined as it is for somebody without dmd and i think that that's a really unique piece for our community that we don't talk about enough right there's always that awkward time when you hear your friends your group of friends talking about some activity or something they did that they didn't invite you to because they knew you couldn't do it you know it's like well, you could have still invited me. So, so yes, yeah, so that's another part of the hard. Yeah. And then knowing too, like that they did that because they wanted to protect you from feeling bad. Right. And not knowing that like the not being invited actually can hurt worse than being, a, than being like, I don't, I can't do that. Right. Or, or trying to offer ways to modify. And like, that's just education. Right. And doing things like this and getting the words out to other parents to be like, you know, like teach your kids, like to include and invite and then let people tell you they can't go. Like, even if you're like, we're going skydiving and you're like, yeah, well, I got DMD. I can't do that. But thank you for like wanting me to be there with you. Like, I'll still go and watch you guys do it. Like that is really important. Right. And, and, and that's, should it be on y'all and us to like educate the rest of the world on doing this? But unfortunately that's how it goes. Right. With, yeah. with groups is, is people without the power have to educate all the people with the power and and unfortunately, that's, an, you know, and that's where that anxiety of being able to talk and be like, hey, guys, that hurt my feelings. Like, this is where that emotional connection comes in. It's like, how comfortable are you with that? To be able to say like that really hurt not being included. Like, I'd rather be included and find a way to do that with you than you guys to try to shield me because then I feel like I'm not wanted. And they would probably be like, well, we wanted you to come, but then we felt bad because you couldn't come and then we didn't want to hurt your feet. Right. And it's like a real the road to hell is paved with good intentions situation. Yeah, because there's always that awkward time you can think, you know, they get you there. It's like. Oh, you can't do that for us. But I, I just wanted to say, though, the skydiving thing, even if I had, didn't have Duchenne, I'm not skydiving. Sorry. So, you know, just say it. It's less scary than you think, Ryan. I promise. I've, I've done it. It's it's The scariest part is probably the plane ride up, and and then the rest is pretty fun and calmish. Yeah, as long as you shoot open. So. Yeah, um, we'll, go, we'll go skydiving, Deej. Oh, I'll DJ it. Fine, I'll, I'll do it. Fine. <laughs> but um, one thing Lindy pointed out is that sometimes family ha- families have solutions that your friends haven't considered. So that's an important thing to tell friends, maybe ahead of time, is like, hey, if there's anything you think of, you might want to try to get me to do. Just even if you don't think I can, say something, because maybe we have a solution to that. Yeah. And if you're a parent of a a younger boy, I would include being able to advocate to other parents like, hey, if you guys, if there are activities and you're worried, like little Johnny can't do it, like, please reach out because we might have solutions or ways to do it or ways to accommodate or ways to that he feels included and and happy with how he's included, you know, and but maybe not doing that activity the same way. And so that and that models a lot to your to the kids and their parents and over time they're kind of learning like oh we just have to like do this thing and like then little johnny can be 
he could be involved in some way maybe doesn't do the same activity but like he can still be a part of this and be with us because that's really what's important is like it's a shared experience that you can be like oh yeah that was funny when so and so did this even if you're not the one jumping out of the plane right like right. they're in a part of it and I think that's what people they're trying to shield your emotions like oh you like we don't want you to feel disappointed well thanks I now I'm disappointed sad left out angry miserable right instead of just being like well that's disappointing but I'm having fun I'm included I get to do these fun things I'm with my friends like so it's sometimes just helping people think about that different which is a big burden to carry but if you're comfortable can be a game changer if you can help people understand that because then most people will be like oh my gosh we thought we were doing something nice not doing something not nice right I re the worst thing somebody did to me is there was this girl in high school that said oh that she had her own challenges but she just telling me oh yeah i was just talking to these girls one of them said they wanted to ask you to the girl ask boy dance really but i can't remember which one it was like oh it takes a lot you know it's kind of it, it you know that it would have been better enough to know but um yeah i, I think one of the important things is also learning to let other people that aren't parents or family help you do things. I would go to summer camps as a boy because my mom wasn't there. You know, but maybe if I'd had other gotten used to other people helping a little. And, and that, mean, that's a good example, Ryan, because I hear that a lot. Like, I want to go do these things with my friend, but I want my mom to come. Well, can your friends do things for you? And uh, they can, but it's a comfort thing, right? And I, 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 I know some guys who are in college who are like, yeah, it's really weird to like talk to other guys about like helping you drink a beer or do X, Y, Z. And it's like, but they want to hang out with you. So they are probably more than willing to do that. Like, that's just like, you would help them if they, with something they needed. Right. And you wouldn't be like, well, that's weird. Like it's, it's just kind of part of it. And if you use humor and you make jokes and, and make it comfortable and you don't make it weird then they'll follow your lead. Right. And so sometimes it's like, how do you, you know, I say this all the time, but like improv classes and stuff guys are huge for y'all because it helps you learn to think on your feet and like use humor to diffuse a situation and, and bring that into kind of like make it feel more comfortable for people because it, it might be weird for you to ask somebody, like if you're a 24 year old dude to ask another 24 year old dude, Hey, can you like feed me right now? Cause I can't. Right. And you know, if we use humor, it'd be like, well, guys, I can't get drunk and hang out with you if no one's helped me do this, right? And we make a joke and everyone's laughing and they're like, oh yeah, right? And we're just like, and now it's comfortable because it is weird for them because they don't have to do that with other people. But if you make it funny and you know, you acknowledge like, I know this is weird, but like, hey, it is what it is. They're going to go along and be like, cool, like we're here to help you, right? And now it's not a big thing and it just is what it is, right? But, yeah. but and that is the onus on you and how do I make people comfortable do being part of my life in the ways that I need it, you know, so I'm comfortable. Right. I do want to say one thing about the improv class. You know, more than thinking on our feet, we need to be able to think on our butts. That is a good point. Touche, Ryan. Touche. <laughs> you know, or go to, you know, you're going to go drink a day. All right. Who's going to be my designated driver? I have but, guys who have, have to have their DDs because they're like, I can't drive my wheelchair home. I'm like, you sound like <laughs> my friend. But, um, you know, you never know. Do you might help one of your buddies decide to become a CNA or a nurse to get used to helping you? And so, yeah, it doesn't hurt to ask. Yeah, or like maybe like, you know, developing new technology and be like, hey, we can like problem solve this, right? Like nothing like a whole bunch of tech dudes getting together to like solve the world's problems, right? That came because somebody who needed help drinking a beer. Like, is that not oh, things, are, so things are solved in this world? <laughs> So go hang out around the physics and engineering uh, classes and that. That's where you want to meet your buddies. Hey, you want to be my buddy? I don't know. You guys, you all have your own. You have so much acumen. You don't need You just need people's hands. Like, you don't need the engineer brains. You already have that. <laughs> you can be my hands today, buddy. Yeah, you got to also turn off DJ's uh, eye gaze because don't tell him what he might say. If he... I like it. I'm here for it. <laughs> I would, I'd have your legs, DJ. All right, there we go. <laughs> um, and then I think adulthood is just kind of the same. Maybe a lot of things we kind of learn in adulthood. It just takes us maybe a little bit longer than most people. 
I think adulthood adulthood brings maturity and I think a willingness to expose and allow yourself to feel uncomfortable that maybe wasn't there. And and I think perspective in adulthood is like the only way I'm going to get this is if I do it. And I think the the double edged you know the the sword of having DMD is like a lot is done for you and and that becomes kind of problematic when like there's certain things you can really only do for yourself from a relationship standpoint and that takes you doing them and doing them in maybe a way that doesn't always feel comfortable and when you're adult and you don't have as much social support and you're not at school and there's not this built-in proximity relationship it's a lot more motivating right to to be uncomfortable to to get access to those things and so I think there's a lot that changes in adulthood that makes that a little bit more easy to allow yourself to do not it's not you know it's still doable when you're younger but I think the the motivators change when you're an adult and before we start delving into DJ's uh -huh. next topic I think we're going to go ahead I'll let you have let DJ have you for a little bit longer I think he's, yeah, I think DJ, I think you're muted. To begin our last segment, I would like to discuss ways to help those of us with Duchenne to overcome these challenges. It's a good, I mean, I, I've talked, I think I've talked a little, I've talked a lot about different ways to do that. I think, um, I think it's important to find a way to think about how do I modify things that work for other people in a way that feels comfortable to me, maybe not overly comfortable because if we're too comfortable, we don't, change doesn't happen, right? Um, but in a way that I can, I can accept doing force myself to do allow myself to and then build upon right like we can't we don't have to get to the end goal right away we can approximate right to that and so I think that's important I think it's important and I think another thing is there's like what are our that like really trying to think of like what are our values and like what's the function of the type of relationship I want and and, and am I doing things that are a that and the ways that I see myself or the messages I give myself or the things I tell myself or the, the fears that I allow myself to, to have that are creating my own barriers, my own false barriers, right? Um, and it, and it, do I need to do work around that? Because if, if I don't see myself as having value and I don't see myself as, as, a, as a dateable person and I am not willing to be uncomfortable and flexible in this, it's going to be really hard to find the type of intimate partner relationships or emotional relationships that you want, right? And so sometimes it's doing individual work so that you are a better version of yourself that so you can develop the relationships you want to develop, right? If you're somebody that can't leave your house because you're so anxious and you can't talk to people and, and you want to date, I mean, that's a big, that's a big, that's a Grand Canyon lead. Right. And so doing work around that to get comfortable and allow like how do I do that? might be really important to get here. Like, so if we're not doing any of this, then then expect to feel disappointed and mad and frustrated that you don't have this. But you're also not doing the things to make that, that gap up. And that's true regardless of who you are, right? Like if you have DMD or not, right? If you are the type of person that is so in your head of internalizing all of these negative messages about what how other people may or may not be perceiving you, it those are hard people to, to date and develop relationships with because, you know, it's, it's all about perception and not about reality. Natalie, could you please share with us some of the ways parents can help their children develop these skills 
to help in building these truly important relationships? I think spending time to really get to know what is it that like, not to like everybody wants friends, everybody wants, you know, somebody to date, but like why, like what, and like helping your child at every stage, childhood, adolescence, adult, attach that want with what is hard for them, whether it's rigidity or OCD or anxiety or ADHD, but helping, because remember, it's not that y'all can't do these things. It's that it takes so much more effort and it's so much harder. And so the motivation has to be there because what you're trying to learn is not easy, right? And so motivating boys and adolescents is hard in general, it's any child and adolescent, but helping them know like, why am I forcing you or why do I want you to be uncomfortable doing this thing or talking in a medical visit? Well, because this is important to you. Is this something you've said you want a deeper relationship or you want to develop friends at school or you want this down the road or you want to work in a, as this kind of setting well you're gonna to have to talk to people or you're gonna to have to do this so helping them understand like I know this is hard but if we avoid it we're never gonna learn this skill set so we have to you know we have to do this or we're gonna do this or what's a way that we can do this giving choice and helping helping children helping nudge them in a way that they're not going to nudge themselves right because that's not how response ever works and so I think you know in childhood that's where parents can be helpful and, and same with adolescence and I think you know there is a part of Growing up, that is like allowing, you know, I don't like the F word, I don't like the failure word, right? We're either winning or we're learning. Um, and learning can be painful. And and y'all's parents are freaking rock stars and you have so much pain and all they want to do is minimize, minimize your pain. And life is hard when you have DMD. And sometimes they do things that kind of cause you harder times because they're trying to minimize your pain. And unfortunately, part of learning is is experiencing things and like learning from them and doing different, um, which means like you might try something socially and it, it fails and that's hard, right? And you might be sad and you're disappointed and then you 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 reflect on it and you have to be like emotionally healthy and you have to be able to go through that process and and separate you from like a maybe something you did and like how am I going to do this different and like can I repair this and learn those skills, right? So that you're comfortable and, and you know how to fail and you know how to be rejected. Rejection hurts for everybody, right? It's always going to hurt. It, it, it's going to hurt even, I mean, it's not going to hurt if you don't do it and you don't get rejected, right? But, but that, you know, part of learning is allowing learning to happen, which means allowing failures to happen, right? Because that's part of the time that we learn. And sometimes we overprotect because we don't want people to experience things that hurt but that's life, man. There's pain and suffering as part of life. And, and how we respond to that is what makes you mentally healthy or not. Do you get stuck in a place of, of suffering or is suffering a moment that you can look at, recognize that this is a moment of suffering, sit with that and continue to, to do the things you want to do. Right. And, and, um, and that's, what's important. And so I think there are times that, that, the, come from a good place, but really can cause a lot of problems down the road, right? Because you can't learn all of these skills in your 20s. These are things that are need to be developed over time because each, you know, you you learn a different skill set in childhood, then you learn adolescence, and you learn adulthood, right? Um, and if you haven't done that, then then you're you're trying to like you've literally never even seen a football game, and now we're putting you in the Super Bowl, right? Um, and so it's nice to have the scaffolding, right? Or you've never even played a computer game. And now, like, we're going to put you on a on an esports team in college, right? And I, like, if you did that to me, I'd be like murdered. I'd be like, I don't even know what these joysticks do, right? My brother tries to teach me. And I'm just like over oh, the gun, like doing this. Um, and so, like, there's you know, like scaffolding, right? And so, like, it's so important that we do that in childhood, and adolescence, and young adulthood in order to like develop the skill sets needed. And so, you know, helping your parents or helping your children fail in a way that promotes learning, grit, and resilience is important. We don't want to set them up to fail to be, like, devastated, right? Um, and that's, you know, I mean, I don't envy a single parent in the world because I think parenting is the most hard and stressful job in the universe. And I think parenting a child with dystronopathy is that much harder and more stressful. And I think um, it's not easy, right? And as a parent, you're not going to make all the right decisions, and and you never will as any parent. Um, 
but I think here, one of the things that we do is, is sometimes unintentionally harmful to our, to our children because we, we want so bad to, to help them not feel additional pain. Natalie, you touched on this a bit earlier, but could you also please share a little more about what our adolescents and adults like Ryan and I can do to, to help improve and for many of us to make these social and emotional relationships? I think talking about it, normalizing that it's hard, right? Normalizing that, like, what works? Like, what are you guys doing? Like, is it, are there ways to kind of, as a community, um, do things together and get out and and have and have opportunity and space to grow in this way, right? And there's safety in numbers and strength in numbers, right? And and sometimes it's like, you know, like you have a friend that, you know, another friend with DMD and you like develop another friend, you know, I know not everyone lives by each other, but if you live in a place where there's other guys, like get together, like go out, like meet people, like, you know, a, adults are very different than at, than adolescents and childhood too and I I talk to a lot of guys where I'm like you're you're living as an adult 25 26 27 in a high school mindset and thinking everyone's going to be treating you like they did in high school and people in high school are mean and adults are like way less mean they get it they live life they're like oh like I have differences like I can't like I have this wrong or I have this wrong or I have this wrong like very few people don't have something of baggage that they bring to a relationship and and adults get that different and so you know socializing in adulthood hits different but it it doesn't hit different if you don't socialize out in the world with adults right and so i think um encouraging like hype man each other like getting out there like recognizing like how do we fail with grace and kind of we can laugh at it and learn from each other like i did this this didn't work like i'm trying this like but and sharing the experiences of success and failure, right? Because I, I talk to a lot of guys who use a lot of dating apps and use a lot of video games to try to meet women and feel very unsatisfied and unfulfilled. And we have to talk about like, what are the, the physical places where there are co-ed, like multiple types of people that may, may be a hobby. And I hear, you know, well, I don't want to do that. Cool. I get that. But you want to meet people. So is this something you'd be willing to do as an opportunity to try to meet new people, right? In real life. And because when you have a shared activity, whether it's a class or something that just has different conversation and it leads to different types of getting to know each other, right? And and have other ways of talking about things. And so I think encouraging and and sharing and and just being honest about like that this is a, a struggle and like it's a shared struggle and it's hard. Um, is really, really important. And I think if, you know, the friends that you have that don't have DMD, like bring them in these conversations. Like I was just talking to a guy the other day who was, who was so down on himself and was just like, should I, do I need to accept that? Like, I'm just not going to be successful in dating apps. And I was like, buddy, everybody that uses dating apps needs to accept that. That's just part of dating. Like you need to, like, there is no guarantee for anybody that you're going to find love that way at all. Like, that's not a guarantee that a company can even make. So like, sometimes it's scaffolding around expectations and around like what's realistic and like how, like how, like, and not taking that as overly personal than it is, because that's just part of life and dating, like dating's hard and it's punishing, right? And there's a lot of people that will tell you like that are able-bodied that are like, they can't find a partner and they, they look, right? And it's not because, and they don't have DMV, right? It's just hard. So I think it's important that we're talking about it, but I think it's important that we take it further and we're like, well, what are you doing, right? And not just like, woe is me, right? Because it's easy to do woe is me, right? And I feel for, like, I'm not saying this is easy for you. Well, I'm not saying that by any means, right? But but it is it is not gonna change if if you don't change it. And you gotta find women- that As we wrap up people. tonight's episode, Sorry, DJ. And it's important to find partners, women, men, but that also have shared values and not just like looks. And we're not just thinking about like, can, do I make money and sex and physicality, right? But like values, like who do I want as a partner? What's important to me? Is it safety? Is it security? Is it somebody I can laugh with? Is it somebody I feel safe with? Is it whatever it is, but like really truly exploring, like what is it that you want in a partner and finding somebody that also has 
is thinking about a relationship like that, right? And if that's not what you're about, you're like, I'm just out here to like find somebody that I can have sex with and do whatever, like do you, right? But then you're not looking for a relationship. You're looking for something different and you need to be honest about that. As we wrap up tonight's episode, Natalie, could you share with us your final thoughts on this truly important aspect of our lives? Final thoughts? Um, I think isolation and lack of meaningful relationships is a, is a huge issue in the United States and everywhere, right? in general, especially with the pandemic. I think for y'all and for, for everybody with DMD that's an adult, I think it's even that much more salient and that much more of a problem. Um, one, because you are dependent and you need people to help and the people that tend to help the most are your parents. Um, and because you all are thoughtful, kind humans and, and loving people tend to want to minimize the burden that that puts on your parents, right? So. You're like, I'm going to stay home and I'm just going to like do whatever you guys thinks best. And I'm not going to like push to, to do things as you, that interrupts your life. And that's a really fair place to be like, and I, and I don't actually have advice on how to, how to best navigate that. But, um, I think, I think it's really hard and I'm not saying it's not hard. Uh, what I'm saying is, can we get to a point that we can develop comfort and willingness to explore alternative ways to live life with DMD that isn't just trying to do these things in a way that minim minimizes any potential of discomfort, right? Only online and only in this way, or I don't like to do that. So I'm not going to, so I'm going to, cause you, you're losing out on significant parts of the population, like, because you don't think you'll like something, right? But like, you might like the people that like that, right? Like, you know, I love sports, but I hate watching sports, but like, I have a lot of friends who watch sports, so I'll go watch sports with you. Like, I'm not watching them. I'm there to just hang out. Right. But if I just didn't do the things, cause I'm like, well, I don't like doing that. Like I would have very few friends. Right. And so it's like finding things that you have some similarities and like, can you expand on that? And I think if you, if we as a community can talk like that and, and share ideas and, and encourage and kind of challenge, like, Hey, I don't know if you're actually doing things to help yourself, that will be a very helpful conversation for, for our community. It, I think an important thing for those of us, you know, if you have a disability, you gotta, if you're trying to build a relationship with somebody and hoping for it to go somewhere romantically, you know, you've got to take time. I think all of us need to take time and, you know, you've got to build that. You can't just maybe rush into it like some people do, or you can't go watch a bunch of YouTube videos and use all their advice. You got to just kind of do it yourself and, you know, just take time, build a good relationship, and got to build that friendship. Listen, I think that's. But did you want me to add a little bit? So I just want to add that. It's, no, I think that those are really good points. And a lot of it, um, you know, Lindy, somebody just asked. If there's added pressure of unknown time. You know, there is that, but. I worried about that for a long time. Then I watched a lot of people I went to school with that passed away, were married. So, you know, we don't know what life's going to give us, so we need to make use of what we can. And we should project that onto somebody else. We should say that, well, they're never, they're not going to want to, you know, be a widow or whatever. So, you know what? We can't make that decision for somebody. So it goes along with everything else. That is a great point, right? Always glad to have you out here, Natalie. Oh, it's always such a pleasure to to be here to talk with both of you. And um, these are just such helpful and rich conversations. And I really hope that, I mean, I would love to hear from other guys that attendees just to like what what do you guys do like where what have i missed the mark on or what do we need to expand on or where you know like what are people doing
I guess it's time to wrap up this week's episode of the Duchenne Live. We hope that everyone enjoyed tonight's show. We definitely enjoyed having you join us, as always, Natalie, for a wonderful conversation about emotional intimacy. We learned many, many things that will truly make a difference in our Duchenne community to help us overcome our challenges to having truly important relationships that we so need in our lives. As always, thanks, everyone, for joining us tonight. See you all again next week for another The Duchenne Life. Have a wonderful evening. Bye.